evolution of the last four years of Bioware has been pretty incredible um, globally, going from just a, you know, a very premium studio to, I guess now, well, gosh, a, a global experience. So, um, so thank you for making your way down here um, as you finish off what we hear is a pretty big project uh, you know, in Austin and around the world. So with that said, get on up here, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we do have a little bit of an elephant in the room with the Star Wars project, but we've got a date. It's coming out pretty quick. So thank you guys very much for joining us. Uh, it's been a long couple of days, but it's been pretty incredible, some of the speakers that we've seen. So why we are here, I want to give you guys a brief intro about Bioware, where we came from, where we are now, um, and then give some of our thoughts on the trends that we're seeing in the industry and where we see some of these trends um, you know, carrying forward over the next little while, because as you know, we've been predominantly an HD console-focused developer for quite a few years, and obviously that's, that's changing, and that's become very apparent from a lot of the sessions that you guys have seen um, over the last couple of days. So um, get free stuff with the catch. Um, it is about audience engagement. Somebody in the back already stole this, this joke from me, but I want you guys to ask questions as we go along. That's what this is about. Um, it's just an easier way to go through this. I've got about 30 minutes of content that I need to go through, and I can gauge it from, uh, from there. So sound good? Excellent. So Bioware History, uh, formed by three gaming doctors. I don't know if everybody knew that there was actually three of them, um, all from Edmonton. Um, but Dr. Ray and Dr. Greg are still obviously fully involved. Um, and then one of them returned to practice, actually went back to medical practice in 1999. Um, our company has been founded on the core values of quality in our games and quality in our workplace, held in the context of humility and integrity. And I'll talk a bit more about that because I believe quality um, regardless of what we're developing in this industry is really, really important, but the definition of what quality actually means is changing as we go through. So um, I will talk a bit more about that actually on some of the, the future slides. In uh, 2005, we were bought along with our friends at Pandemic um, by Elevation Partners. We formed, funny enough, Bioware Pandemic Studios. And uh, we liked diligence so much, we got bought again in 2008, and now we're now part of Electronic Arts. So when I started at Bioware um, in 2000, I was employee number 82. We've got seven locations worldwide as part of the label and uh, a little over 1,000 employees now. So big chunk of Electronic Arts. Oops. Uh, Bioware values. So again, I wanted to chat a bit more about this. So quality in, the, in our products means that we try and make each game better than the last. Um, we want to make great games, but we also want to make great games that sell. That's, that's really why we do this. It's, it's passion and everything else, but if you don't make money, you're not going to survive in the industry. Um, we love innovative content, and that's another area that's really changing with the advent of the different platforms that have been coming out in the last little while. So, and then com that also means commitments to our audience. Um, again, put a pin in that, we'll chat a bit more. And then quality in the workplace. So we, we really want to attract and retain the best employees that we can. And so that means doing different sorts of programs when we bring them. I, mean, I, I got to admit, Edmonton is not exactly a hotbed to attract people to. Um, but we do, we do try to do different things. So extra time off at Christmas. We certainly give bonus days at the end of a project. We bring in breakfast every day. And we've been doing that since 2001. Um, you know, work crunch, get fed. Hope we try our best to avoid those sorts of things. And it's about open communication. These two core values do sometimes end up in conflict with each other. Um, and a prime example is crunch. Uh, it's kind of hard to have quality in the workplace when you've got people crunching. However, to get that game out and get it on target and on quality, sometimes that has to happen. And so that's why we, the, the, you know, the little bit of conflict with these two values is actually not a bad thing. If it's held in the context of humility and integrity, they generally will hold you true and, and take you to the right answer. And that's, that's from Ray and Greg. That was from day one back in 1995. Those values have stayed the same. Our community then, um, I remember in 2000, Ray and Greg were doing RSS feeds and chatting with 35 people worldwide. We thought that was the coolest thing on the planet. Um, and then we decided to launch a community website on our Bioware.com site. And it really, you know, I don't think we need to go through the details of what happened, but that linear growth, it just, it was the start of where we started to th see things moving online for us um, from an engagement perspective with our audience. It was giving our audience a chance to communicate with us through our forum boards and in, you know, different ways through that. Um, our community now, thanks to our great audience, we've been able to migrate that from a forums base to a social base. We've got 
a social site with over 3.2 million registered users. We have over 2.4 million that get our regular newsletters on a double opt-in, so they're very interested in learning more about us and what's coming up and what we're doing. We have about 68 million page views per month now, 2.7 million Facebook fans, quarter million Twitter followers. Um, and it's wonderful. We're starting to see an opportunity for us to blend some entertainment together, and that's a blending on the content side, that's a blending on the consumption side, and it's a blending on the platform side. And that's where I think the rest of this talk will go from here, is we'll talk a bit more about how those things are happening. Um, an example, Felicia Day, um, she has produced a web series called Dragon Age Redemption. It's set in the Dragon Age universe. Um, it's a web-based series. It's being delivered on YouTube with our partners at Machinima. Um, we took her character and that she had written and that story, and we've taken that character and put it into a piece of downloadable content that you can actually play as part of Dragon Age 2. Again, it's just the start of the blending, and there's so much opportunity in this area. So, any questions so far? Is it making sense? Good. The world is changing, and yeah, it's changing fast. I think we all know this. Um, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, delivery of music digitally. Um, phones, smartphones, the iPhone, Android phones. Hard to believe it's only been five years that this has happened. Like all of this has been in the last five years. And it's not just time compression, it's velocity accelerating. And so change velocity is happening at a faster and faster rate. So I, I used the printing press analogy. Um, it took us 150 years to get from a printing press to a typewriter to a computer. Now, it took three years for Facebook to hit 20 million users. It took Google Plus less than a month. So the acceleration of, 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 uh, of change is, is, is just, it's just happening more rapidly. And it's a scary, daunting thing. Um, and that's very, very difficult for a game developer like us who takes three to five years to make a game um, to stay up to speed on how things are happening. And so that's why I'm really glad to see all the different groups. I see Jesse here from Rivet. Um, an expert in the field, I don't know if any of you guys caught his talk a little earlier today, but you know he's an expert in our field, in that field that we would certainly love to turn to and get some help as we try to start to to uh, to take advantage of some of these different areas. Uh, I, I put this picture in here because I had a conversation with my 11-year-old daughter when I got my iPhone, and she was able to fire it up faster than I was. And it, do you remember the old story where your parents used to say, "Hey, I had to walk, you know, uphill both directions in snowstorms." <laughs> My kids now would turn around and say, why didn't you just check the weather on your phone before you left, right? It's just, they don't remember a period of time where things weren't online. And that's a pretty interesting and scary thing as well. Like, kids now don't know anything else but an online world. Now, I'm, I, I'm guessing the average age in here is about 25. I'm quite a bit older, but that's, you know, that's quite daunting for me, so. Content consumption is changing, and that's driving the market. So I want to spend a couple of minutes on this slide. So what this is showing is, a worldwide software market projection of revenues over the next five years. It's got calendar year 10, and then it slides out to calendar year 14. So this one here is packaged goods, and then you got downloadable content. You've got MMOs, you've got the play for free models, and you've got the mobile models. Some of the categorizations are getting a little bit more blurry, but let's just assume that this is correct right now, and we can work with that. I put a percentage down here. Here's something interesting. Uh, for a platform that really didn't exist five years ago, in 2010, 45% of the gaming industry revenues were generated digitally. This calendar year, the majority of the gaming revenues are being generated digitally. That's, that's pretty incredible. And then when you look at the capitalized annual growth rate at the different categories, the market is actually looking to grow at 7% per year, but packaged goods is dropping at 4% per year. Right? So you can see that there is definitely a predominant shift towards digital, where by fiscal year, calendar year 14, sorry, the ex expectation is to have 64% of the revenues in that market generated digitally. And player crossover is growing. Um, we got a hold of a recent study that said that 70% of HD players, so console players generally, are gaming on other platforms. So it's it's not just that there are more game, or it's not just that there are more gamers, but there are also gamers that are wanting to try content consumption on different platforms as well, which is something that's very interesting and exciting for us. So, scary stuff. How do we not become the dinosaurs, uh, or go the way of the dinosaurs? And there's some things that we've been looking at that we want, that we believe will help 
us in our quest as we drive through the industry. One of those is new definitions of quality. Did, uh, did any of you guys catch the uh, um, shoot first, ask question later panel yesterday with you know basically four iconic industry vets? Um, Mark from Riot Games had an interesting comment where it was very frustrating for him that League of Legends got a 60% review score from somebody um, that said there wasn't good value to the game, and the irony of that is the game is free. So it's, <laughs> there's, there's, this, there's this change that's happening now where quality really needs to be redefined. It's, it's, it's becoming more relative as opposed to absolute. There, there's still a place for Metacritic. Metacritic is an important indication of you know, quality of the game. It's, 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 it definitely serves a purpose, but it's relative now. It's relative to, um, it, it's going to be defined as much by the consumer as it is by the product. It's relative to, to the genre or the platform that that product is being served on. Um, there's K factor and virality and net, net promoter scores. Do you, is K factor sort of a commonly understood term, you guys? It, it's really kind of a, a measure between your acquisition costs where you actually have to buy the customer versus your organic or referral growth. And that factor, you know, tells you what you're truly costing to get users into your game. Um, that becomes a pretty important test of what quality is when you think about it. And your net promoter score are people promoting your game. Because if they're promoting your game, that's, that's success in some of these new genres. Um, fidelity, again, we, I sort of mentioned that. It's fidelity relative to, to competition and other forms of entertainment. Um, and the reality is, is that, you know, when it's defined as much by the consumer versus the product, humility and integrity becomes that much more important for anybody that has been listening to some of the customers. Some of the stuff can be pretty tough to listen to sometimes. It's very, very difficult. And if you don't have that humility and integrity when you start to digest some of this inf information, you might become defensive. It gets very difficult to, to find what they're actually really trying to say to make your game that much better. Um, KPIs are key performance indicators. I, I would love to get to a day where we don't actually have a launch date, we have a launch window. You've got your game out there, people are playing it a little bit, they're giving you feedback, you're iterating on that product, you're getting it better and better, and when you hit a certain performance indicator level, that's when you launch the game, that's when you go live. So, and then this concept of, of lose to win, and I was actually talking with Jesse just before I came in here about this concept of, um, which really makes publishers' brains explode, is actually building product that you know is going to fail, but use that as a learning opportunity to build something that can win. And that's a, that's a very difficult concept for folks. So, um, but, but this is sort of the, the direction that we see quality, or we believe that quality definition needs to go. So go ahead. I was going to ask you a quick question. Cool like this. I, these are awesome. They're really a big dramatic shift. But now that you're owned by EA, and you have, there's a, a need to also reflect the brand of the publisher, yep. did you run into issues? I mean, there are two questions. The first is being able to have this paradigm shift happen over seven studios, but also, um, how is it that you were able to get, in a sense, uh, the, the publisher to also understand the value of this, especially looking at some things that might seem a little bit, you know, counterintuitive to the brand, like losing the win, like, ah, oh, we don't really want to put our brand on a, on a project that might have three months of, of bad scores, you know? Yep. Did, you, did you find ways to kind of solve that communication and that, and that persuasion of the publisher? So that, there's, I have multiple answers to that one. The, I mean, the, the, the one good thing is that, you know, when we when we originally went through the acquisition with EA, John Ricatello, who is the CEO of EA, was also our CEO back at at the Bioware pandemic days. Um, so we actually have a pretty good relationship with him. And when we went into the acquisition with Electronic Arts, you know, um, John's vision for the organization was really to be a developer focused organization, and that's where the origin of the labels came from in the first place. When he joined, it was April of 2007 that I think he started there. He flipped that organization upside down and said, you know what, it's the developers that need to tell us what they want to make, and then it's the marketer's responsibility and job to try and sell that. Now, that, that's an overly simplified way to go because, you know, there has to be a certain amount of tension and, and, and checks and balances between the marketing aspect, like, again, making great games that sell, right, at the outset of what our core values are. Um, but it's generally been pretty good. And then the second thing is that EA has made great efforts in the last little while to expand and grow its digital revenue markets, predominantly through acquisition, but, you know, with, with the acquisition of PopCat and Jamdat originally in the mobile space, um, Playfish, they've really been making efforts to try and build out different pillars within the organization um, and drive digital revenue. And so at, at the face of it, they've already started doing some of this stuff. And so it hasn't been a difficult discussion um, to do this and drive it forward within the organization. So uh, it's interesting here. 
this is the free gift stuff, so that's, that's what you get for asking a question. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm waiting for all the hands to go up. So they have to be, now that, the, that this is out, it has to be a legitimate question, not like what I had for breakfast. That won't count. Okay, so are there any other questions on this, this concept and this thinking? Did, that, did I answer your question? That makes sense? You did, it was great. Yeah, good. As, 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 he, as he puts on the shirt. Um, go ahead. Does someone else have it? Oh, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. With BioWare's products being pushed out to a lot of different regional, or BioWare has a heavy emphasis on localization yep. off the get-go, that you have the same launch date for, say, Mass Effect or Dragon Age, not Dragon Age, uh, Mass Effect or, or any of the games, at, uh, in, what, five or six different regions at the same day. Yep. Um, how do you measure the quality across that? Because one... Because viral, virality, like one type of game may not sell well in a different market. Like say, I love Mass Effect, but it didn't really sell well in Japan, for instance. Correct. Yeah. So, you're, are you asking? So, the, the, is the question in relation to the are what we do from a quality, apply to localized apply, versions as well, or regionally? Those, like, are they, are they consistent? So. If you, if you measure quality and say, okay, all right, this is awesome quality, but strangely it doesn't sell well in Japan, mm -hmm. how, do you, how, how do you adjust for that, or how do you account for that difference there? So from, from I'll, I'll try and answer it in, the, in a post-mortem sort of sense. So this, this happens all the time, and, and just to go back, yes, you're absolutely right. We typically, we, we have different levels of localization, so sometimes we'll do a deep localization where we actually have to make changes to the game itself, and then there's the full voiceover localizations, which is a fairly expensive endeavor for us, because especially since we started having um, your playable character having voice assets. Um, so, for example, in Mass Effect, you can imagine that we have a male and a female shepherd um, with all the different choices that you could make. It, it turns it turns into a fairly expensive endeavor. Um, and then we do text locs and then no locs. And we usually do a market analysis up front to try and understand, and, and that's the other thing that's nice about being part of EA, is they do have regional offices in pretty well everywhere around the world, and it becomes their responsibility for understanding their market, understanding their audiences, doing the market research that they need for them to be able to say, yes, we believe that we can sell this number of units, and if we get a text, lo you know, that's of the English version, if we get a text localized version, we get this number of incremental, additional incremental units, which justifies the cost of the localization. And then the post-mortem aspect is, okay, we said that we were going to get these results. Did we actually achieve them? And then if we didn't achieve them, or we did, why or why not? Right? And that, that just becomes part of the marketing and community's responsibility to gauge that. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Hang on, I owe this gentleman a shirt. Go for it. So I keep looking at that launch window versus launch date bullet. <laughs> yep. And I think a lot of us here love to have launch windows. Yep. Um, and especially now that you're part of EA, do you ever see that actually being a possibility? Is that something that you guys are internally fighting for? It's happening already. It's absolutely happening already. And, and it becomes easier and easier to accept the more you move into a digital world. So the less packaged good dependent the product is, the easier it is to, to do a launch window versus a launch date. So how do you communicate that to your audience? Because, so, you know, like obviously there are people that literally take a Tuesday off because they know yeah. the game is shipping or whatever. So yeah. if you're going to tell them some nebulous, like I'm obviously saying that Right, right. It, it kind of reminds me of a funny story, and it's, this goes back to all the way to Baldur's Gate, believe it or not. And our publisher back then was Interplay, and uh, there's we we have these on our wall because it's it's sort of a, you know, it's sort of how Bioware has always tried to operate from a quality perspective, where it said Baldur's Gate coming in April. And then two months later, there's another ad that goes into a magazine, Baldur's Gate coming in July. And then there was another ad that went out. It said, Baldur's Gate coming in fall. And it didn't even put a year on that one. 
and then the, the next one was Baldur's Gate coming soon. And that was, that was how they ended up managing that part. So uh, it is certainly more difficult in the packaged goods environment. That's absolutely true, especially now with the long lead times, the manufacturing lead times, and how you're trying to place things in quarters. I think the launch window concept applies more to the new models that are coming out. It's the free-to-plays. It's the, it's the ones where you do need key performance indicators to, to be able to test the health of your product before you launch. Because although you can make iterations, if your launch is such a failure, and I mean, Jesse, you could probably speak to this too. If your launch is such a failure, you will lose that traction. It will just it will just burn and crash before it's even had an opportunity to go. So I, I kind of avoided your question, but it, it it predominantly applies less to packaged goods. Although I mean, and the MMO is a, is a very good example. Um, you know, there's there's different stages of the Tor MMO, which is you know arguably our well, it's not arguably it is our biggest game that we've ever made. And you know it's it's got different stages of closed beta, open beta, and different tests that we're doing to try and you know and and it was only just recently that we announced that date because we were trying to focus that and make sure that we could have a successful launch. Okay, you get the hoodie. Thank you for. I won't. I won't. My question, but still answering. <laughs> yeah, I won't. Uh, I won't throw that one because that one's a heavy shirt. Go. Yeah. Okay, with the launch window and the launch date, how do you handle reviewers looking at the games on the launch window and them constantly, like, say it's an open beta or a closed beta, mm -hmm. they have to go to it in their fashion that they're playing it, but they're still playing it every day. Yep. How do you tell them, this is that you should review our game? It's, I, you know, and again, it, the reviewers are, from our perspective, are no different than our consumers. Their, their feedback is valuable regardless of how vitriol it may be. And, you know, that happens. You still, you know, and, and this is why I link it back to the core values, uh, you know, and in, in the context of humility and integrity, you still need to listen to this. You still need to understand. And, and it becomes your job to try and figure out what are they actually saying, right? And, I mean, there's different, there's different things that we look at. Again, you know, like when I, when I go back to Mark's example about, you know, League of Legends getting a 60 because there was not good value for a free game, there's, there's different things that we look back on and, and are able to say, yeah, you know what, in, in spite of that, you know, our, our downloadable content gets very, very, um, you know, generally gets lower review scores than the main game. That's just the way it is. Um, however, the consumers like it. They, they tell us good information about it, and we're able to iterate and make each piece of content better and better as we go. Yeah, that's, you know, it, that's part of the communication. <laughs> it's, uh, you're right, there, there's certainly challenges on that. Um, because yeah, panic does set in. There's a lot of investment that goes into these games. Uh, this is probably going to start to kill some of the questions that I'm answering because that's my last shirt. <laughs> Go ahead. You speak on these uh, key performance indicators and such, and, the, and I see them as being very strong for the launch window uh, approach, mm -hmm. which very much works with uh, digital. But uh, being a digital launch and being able to push say patches afterwards, how do you manage that? In other words, the quality. How do you get the the level of quality that you want to meet at the launch window without saying, oh, you know, we can always fix it later and just stumble into it. So it's, uh, maybe is the question you're asking, how do we choose what we're fixing versus not fixing yeah, when we go through these? So, you know, again, Bioware is really in its infancy in this area. I, I keep putting you on the spot, Jesse, because you're sitting right front and center, right? But it, we, we are in our infancy and we are learning, and that's why we would turn to people like that to say, sorry, people like that, people like Jesse, where, you know, we, we could ask, like, what are the key indicators? And, and sometimes it's a bit of lose to win. You know, sometimes you'll make a feature change and it'll either epically fail or, you know, and, and you try and you fix it fairly quickly. Sometimes you do things like A-B testing. If you have the, the luxury of being able to split your market and have enough information about your user set, you can actually split and do different tests at the same time to see which feature resonates better. So there's different techniques, but I, I would turn to, to Jesse, to did I did I answer that well? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The, the models right now, and I don't know what you target, but people are trying to to predict that the predictive models now are being able to predict within seven days of customer acquisition what their lifetime value is. Right. That's frightening. That you think that you could, you, that, you know, that the models are getting that sophisticated and we're starting to get that much, 
statistical relevance to be able to say in seven days, I know how much money I'm going to make from that particular person of that cohort. By, exactly, of that cohort. Yeah. So, yes? Which game is that again, Gordon? Which, which game is that again? Very different games, yep. very different platforms, yep. some people from stores, people digitally. I guess I'm curious of how much energy you put towards harnessing that diverse audience into this very specific new universe versus maybe just acquiring new folks. So are you are you asking like what effort do we do to port our audience across to the different yeah. games that we're launching or Yeah, I, I think, so to answer that, it's, it's kind of, and I'll talk a bit more, I think I've got a slide on a little on, later on that talks about push versus pull. And when we made the migration from the forums to a social-based environment, we made, a, we made a mistake. We were using the social sites as a push. We were pushing the marketing information, and we still have a tendency to do that. Where in actuality, it, it's, it should be more of a pull. We should be pulling our consumers. They should be telling us what they want, and then we give them what they want. Um, and so the answer to that is that we don't actually actively work our customers and try and push them to go to the next game. It really is based on what their interests are and as we get more sophisticated what their past behaviors are. So does that answer your question? I'll take one more and then I'll drive on. Um, I'm, I've been modding and playing with your tools since Neverwinter Nights. Yes. Through 2 and then through DA. Mm -hmm. What I love is how much have I seen the tools evolve quite dramatically from say Neverwinter Nights 1 through DA. Mm-hmm. How much does those tools you create actually impact how you shape your quality? Um, so just to make sure I get the question right, are you asking, you're asking how... How much investment do you put in those tools to make them what you need to get the quality that you want? Tons. Tons. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, one of the things that Bioware is very good at is building tools. Um, because we have a tendency to build very big games. And if you can't have an, if you don't have an effective way to get content into the game, uh, to build the content and then get the content running in the game, um, then your our dev cycles aren't three to five; they're like eight to twelve at that point in time. So, uh, you, so you actually use the Dragon Age tool set. I, I wrote the tutorial. You are hardcore. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, let's drive on a bit here. What, how are we doing for time? Well, we got a bit of time yet. Um, so embrace that consumers are more connected than ever. Uh, I had so many different ways that I wanted to try and approach this slide. This is, this is sort of how I would ideally love to view our universes. I think realistically being an HD developer, um, we probably move this one more to the middle still. I mean, we're still a little bit HD centric, but I would love to, to, I'd love to investigate the gamification of that IP universe. And we're starting to see it happen already. Like how many people here play Need for Speed? So you guys have seen the auto log and how that is sort of gamifying the, you know, through achievements, through challenges. It's actually taking you out of the actual individual game. And you can see how it could be extrapolated into other different games. And it, it actually becomes a game in and of itself. And then creating content that, that, that works across all of these different platforms. I mean, we do, quite frankly, we do a shitty job of hitting our dates on this. It's going to be hard to do it on everything else, but, you know, that, that's part of that evolution, right? And partnering with the people that know what they're doing in these different areas. So what, so what I wanted to talk about more on this slide, I think, is that, that embrace that consumers are more connected than ever. So we've already seen that, you know, when you, when you look at the advent of the social site, so the social one is pretty straightforward. Um, the within games, we've, we've, you know, we've talked a bit about that already. Across genres, we're actually seeing people starting to, to, to be, get connected across different genres where you're seeing some blending of certain genres across games like the Need for Speed example, the Autolog that I just gave you, and then across platforms. So we're, we're, we're people are, are starting to solve the, the, the walled garden with, you know, with platform agnosticity. I think I made that word up, but you know, where, where you're starting to see persistence across platforms as opposed to persistence within platforms. So go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, um what kind of partners are you working with when you're trying to um, merge these these platforms together? 
We are um, mostly on unannounced stuff at this point in time. Uh, I, I think, like, just to, to take the question to the general, what we're looking for are people that share the same sort of passion for their 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 platforms, for lack of a better description, that we share for ours and the ones that we know, as well as people that have a passion for for the, the the IP universe itself, right? If if they're not a fan of Dragon Age or they're they're not a fan of of Ultima, um, to have them be to have them building content for us can become challenging, right? Because they, they just don't share that passion. I mean, that's what that's what makes our industry so special is the is that core passion that people have. There's not a lot of industries that can bring such a diverse group of people together that will sit in a room for two days and and share stories and insights. It just it just doesn't happen. I'm from the oil patch originally, so I, I can tell you that doesn't happen there. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'm kind of, pardon me. I'm kind of curious about how much transmedia actually drives revenue with uh, player bases back to your core games. So, you have, like, so the Felicia example of. Yeah, that, but I mean, you also have like, the Dragon Age uh, on Facebook, and then we said that it did. Uh, we just got to talk at GC uh, online a couple weeks ago about mm -hmm. that. And, um, you know, how that they were really trying to harness those core gamers. Well, I'm kind of wondering how much that kind of stuff actually drives more fans back to your core training. How much trans media actually affects that? So it does. Um, that's a vague answer. Um, how much will vary from game to game, and and that's really the magic that we're trying to figure out. And it, it's not necessarily that our objective is to drive people to to buy the different pieces of content. It, again, it's part of the we want people to tell us what they want. We want people to come in and be able to digest our universe in many many different ways. It's I got a slide on it later on, but I'll talk to it now. It's it's like the field of dreams thinking, right? If you build it, they will come. Um, so you know, we we want to give quality entertainment to our people where they're consuming it in different ways. You know, they're, they, people don't want a Mass Effect mobile game that is Mass Effect 2 that they play on the bus ride home. Um, or m maybe they do, but you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, it might not be the best use of that IP universe in that situation. It's just not as relevant. So. Absolutely. Yeah, we use social. We, we have social, we, we, we have, um, we do polls on our social site all the time, just asking people what their thoughts are. Hey, what about this? How about, it, it's, it's quite powerful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, so that segues quite well is that content needs to be relevant. And, and I split relevance into two. And I, I've heard the concept of relevance talked about actually a few times. And you guys have probably heard people saying that, you know, relevance is quite important. There's certainly the, the importance of, the actual content itself, and again, I, you, you, know, you note the theme, I keep hammering on the quality, but it has to be quality, it has to be meaningful, right? And, it, and it's about understanding your consumer. They will tell you what you want, what, what, what they want. You just have to be willing to listen, and you have to be willing to figure out what they're try, actually telling you. And consumers are smart, and they are more connected now than ever. I mean, that, that's, that's just the reality. But then there's also situational relevance, and this is really answering the, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And some of those are pretty easy, right? Like, telemetry will tell you, hey, you know, um, they were consuming this at this point in time on this device. Like that stuff is pretty easy. The whys, that's a hell of a lot harder to figure out. And I think people are still trying to figure out why, why are people spending money on my game? I'm not entirely sure, but I'm really happy that they are. So people consume content different ways at different times, right? And that's that situational relevance that people sometimes forget. And Bioware has, you know, we've made some mistakes in that where we have created some content that which just wasn't platform or situationally relevant. And again, it's it's that pull versus push mentality, listening to the consumer voices and, and watching what their actions actually are, because sometimes they can't even articulate what they really mean. So um, and then sustain quality content for every situation. And this is just this is the, the whole concept of the new business models where you, when you have when you have quality uh, content that's available, that leads to acquisition, that leads to engagement, and that's where your monetization comes from. Does that make sense? Yeah. New tools to understand your customer. There have been actually several talks that have been talking about analytics. Um, and with all due respect to Max the, the dog from MDK2, which is my favorite game, which is why I put it up there, um, I would much rather have a kick-ass Commander Shepard at my tool disposal. So this is telemetry, this is analytics, this is technology, this is the, the whole concept of CRM, um, the, the, the key performance indicators. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. When we launched Mass Effect 1, we had telemetry in that game. And thank God we were on the second floor because our analytics guy would have jumped out the window. 
We had 80 million telemetry hits in 24 hours, crashed all of our servers, took them six months to parse through the data, and we still couldn't get anything that was actually actionable from that information. And, and that happens, I mean, when, when telemetry is in its infancy, it's, it's very easy to collect data, but it's very, very hard to make it collected in a way that you can be agile, which is where the, this whole advent of the social space has been so brilliant it's because that's their bread and butter. They are teaching us so much about agility and understanding metrics and understanding telemetry. Um, and then actually having something that's actionable. So it's, it's not just gathering data, it's actually gathering data that helps us make better decisions. And that's, that's really key and that's really critical and it's something that we still struggle with right now. So especially when you're, you know, on an HD side of things where content does take time. So sometimes some of the telemetry that we get gets incorporated into the next games. And that's, that's just the reality of how we've had to operate. Does that make sense? Yeah? How are we doing for time? Pretty good. The field of dreams. So new platforms and new business models. And this makes my accountant heart skip a couple of beats every time I talk about this slide. I really love it. So you got your traditional revenue model, which I think everybody is pretty, pretty understanding of. It's a constrained revenue model. That's the reality, right? There's, there's users that are willing to pay more, and there's people that are, will not engage in your franchise because the, it, it's beyond their price point where they want, they want to enter the franchise. So enter the new MTX and the digital revenue models. And oh, I don't know why that's out of the box, but the, the, I think it's because I said whales before, but I changed it to the highly engaged. Um, this is about, you know, fully monetizing people, right? And the free riders, like, they're as important as anything else. You want free riders because you want people in your game playing around, telling you more stuff, telling you what you're doing wrong so you could actually make them, you know, you can monetize them. Okay. And then it, we've heard about lifetime value. What, what I really actually, I would love a metric called lifetime happiness. Um, and that's what the LTH is. What is the true happiness of your customer? And I think it, from a lifetime value perspective, is probably an indication of that. So if, you're, if your lifetime value of your customers is increasing, that, that probably begets happiness. But it's an interesting way to think from a developer perspective. What content will make them happy, right? And when you, when you think about it that way, I think that will actually help you lead to better monetization and better enjoyment, better engagement, all those things that really make the world go round for us. And help wanted. So we've kind of talked about this already. We, we really do want to partner with people that are platform exp experts, right? So this is outside the HD world, people that understand these different models better than we do. We're really in our infancy in this area. Um, and then, you know, again, telemetry and, you know, actionable and, and agile and then the technology experts. I mean, we really are on the cusp of having platforms, you know, content crossing platforms, which I think is really interesting, really interesting to have that persistence. So. Again, being a dinosaur, I don't want to be the way dinosaurs. I would much rather think about it like this. Because uh, this shit is awesome. It really is. It's, it's exciting. It's challenging. But I, I really believe that <laughs> stuff like this is really, really important. I mean, um, hats off, Gordon, to you guys. I think these sorts of sessions is, is very, very good um, in the industry. And we really appreciate it. And that's my presentation. So thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, I think the question is a lot of us have dealt with is uh, the nebulous how do you improve ROI on doing new experiences, and especially the community space and the social space. Yeah. Um, what is your take on is it likes, is it follower increases, is it translated to sales? I, I think that goes back to the, that's, oops, I went back way too far. I just wanted to keep it on that. That shit is awesome. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it, I, it, so that's a, that could be a very, the, the question was what sort of indicators do we look to when we're assessing quality, I guess, for all intents and purposes. And it kind of goes back to that quality slide. It really depends on what the game is. It depends on what we're trying to do. It really depends on what the strategic objective is. Like from our perspective, um, sometimes I'm, as, as the business development guy, I'm absolutely totally happy to make an investment in something that I perceive as strategic and the label perceives as strategic. Right, so success for me would be as simple as, hey, we've got a play in here and it's quality. It's at that Bioware quality and people are enjoying it. So it could be something as simple as that. But it really depends on, you know, on what type of game we're doing. And it would turn to, you know, to the, to the, 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 the key performance indicators that are becoming more and more commonly understood as we, as we go through this transition. So I'm avoiding your question. I don't, I don't have anything else for that. Hmm? Yeah, go. Uh, yeah, I think you were first. So go ahead. And then one there and one here. So, you guys do a lot of transmedia stuff. It, it's trying to, yeah. Is that 
really more driven by, you know, considering your long death cycles, it's great to have those touch points with your consumers. Mm -hmm. like, so is it is your transmedia stuff more uh, from a marketing standpoint, or is it from more like your game design type of, like who's pushing that? Me, game teams. Um, and yeah, it's... It's kind of thinking of, it, I, I would love to get away, you know, going back to that slide where it's the HD launch, fire and forget mentality. I, I want software as a service, and it's a poor use of the term, but I want people to have that ability to engage in our franchises in different ways. And, and our community's actually been very, very receptive to it. Um, you know, we've got seven or eight novels across the two franchises now that have probably sold nearly a million copies. Like, there's, there's a lot of, people want to consume content. Um, we've got some great partners. Dark Horse Comics is a great partner for us. They love working with our franchises. They've, they, uh, they, they've had a Mass Effect comic series now for the last year and a half. Um, we just announced that they've taken on Dragon Age as well. So, you know, it's, it's just, again, it's, it's more of a, uh, a sustainability model, giving people that opportunity to, to engage and, you know, hopefully bring in some incremental revenue as well. So, um, I think there was, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that chart you had that showed the kind of uh, revenue that could, I mean, there's no perfect price discrimination, the one with the yeah. free-to-play and yeah. transacting every step of the way. Yeah. I mean, that could be applied to the traditional MMO subscription model as well. Uh, $15 a month leaves a lot of people out who pay $2 a month, and a lot of people who would pay $40 or $60 a month. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not touching this one with a 10-foot ball. <laughs> Well, so do you agree with uh, Smedley, though, who said this is the last big subscription model uh, that we're going to see, and from this point forward, it will be all free to play? I th think the standard for the larger subscription-based games is definitely changing, right? Um, I'm leaving it at that. <laughs> so I, ha I have some other opinions on that, too. But, you know, I, I think that it, it's certainly, let me answer it this way, it's not as broad as what it used to be. Right? I think that um, from a value proposition perspective, um, you're going to see a lot less of the subscription-based MMOs um, on a go-forward basis because there is play-for-free that are out there. And it's not just on PC. There's play-for-free. I mean, there's, there's persistent world MMOs on the iPad and the iPhone. Right? Guys like Space Time Studios are making them now. So um, go ahead. I'll get you, Gordon. If you're going to stretch out more and more towards transmedia, some more a lot of touch, more casual users, yep. do you think it's going to change your IPs? So that that's an interesting question, and I'll, I'll use social gaming as an example. I think there was a, there was a talk. I think you were talking about The Sims, and I I think what we're starting to see now is that the the, the social gaming market is starting to build its own genres as well. Um, so for example, I would I would classify The Sims as a casual. Um, mass market social game. Um, you've got companies like, you know, you'd mentioned Kixai and Kabam that are building more core social games. Um, they do monetize higher. Um, they are more of a core player. And so again, it, it's in the, you know, in the quality assessment that we would be doing, that would be more of the direction that we would go in the example of the social gaming world. And, and that market didn't exist, correct me if I'm wrong, but it didn't exist two and a half years ago, right? It just, it just did not exist. Um, this year, it's between 200 and 300 million. So, I, I, again, I, we're not going to enter into the social gaming market just for the sake of entering into the social gaming market. It goes back to that relevance. It has to be relevant to the franchise. It has to be relevant to the situation. So, I, I better, because he'll never invite me back if I don't ask him. So, go ahead, Gordon. How do you build your creative teams like, to, to keep your brand true and the right quality? Across different media, you know, because yeah. you have your, you know, your, like you know, what I mean, like yep. the vision of mass media, they got to be top quality social, but top quality HD and top yep. quality mobile, yeah. and also whatever the truth of mass media. So I, I, there's two ways to look at that question, and I'm, so I'll ask it back to you. Are you asking how do our do we keep our teams wanting to be engaged with all of these different platforms? And, or are you? You're like a visionary. Like I guess I always figure that at the heart of these things, there's yep. a creative vision very because of this is what's true and this yep. is what's false about the universe. But yep. they have not just be a movie vision, they've got to have a transmedia vision. Like a Correct. Type of creative person. I, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm still doing what I'm doing. Um, and, and it really is just a core function of Bioware. Bioware is always 
had the, the franchise ownership residing with the team from day one. I mean, that's been, we, we have taken a very field of dreams sort of perspective from the running of the business, right? If we give them the resources and the time, they will make the quality game that they want to make. And it's the same thing with the transmedia. So yes, the, the franchises have owners and yes, they have specific creative directors and executive producers that help frame that. Um, but the Felicia one is a great example. Like Felicia came to us and said, I, I love Dragon Age and I want to write a story in that world and do a web series. And we said, yeah, go for it. And then her and, uh, and Mike Laidlaw, who's the creative director for Dragon Age, nerded out for two and a half hours. Like, our, our executive producer's like, I, she's talking about stuff I don't even know. So, I mean, and that's, that's her passion, right? Like, she's a very, very passionate in individual, and that's why it was just a great partnership, right? Um, any others? I think we got about five more minutes, so go ahead. Yeah, I was going to go back, also, getting back to, as you know. Nice shirt, by the way. Um, I don't think it's... <laughs> um, so much of dealing with multiple platform distribution is obviously scaling up and scaling down timelines. I, I don't want to say quality, but like level of polish for a screen this big, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then of course now you're dealing also with immediate feedback. Have you, has Bioware, I don't want to say had a you know, crisis of confidence, but have you had to change the way that you uh, iterate and create feedback for your team because they're getting so much feedback as opposed to in the past where they would work kind of in solitude for a couple of years, boom, ship the device, mm -hmm. ship the game. How have you kind of adapted to keep your core values and be like, look, but we're doing this quality. I understand the feedback shows that we're not quite at the polish level yet, yeah. but we'll get there. Yeah. Have you had to do some different sort of um, you know, personal management, kind of leadership management? Absolutely. And, and that's, the, that, that's that whole concept of the overlay of the humility and integrity. Um, because, yeah, sometimes it's really, really hard to hear people. You know, when people have invested so much time and effort and passion um, into their game and into what they've built, um, yeah, some of that stuff is, quite frankly, can be hurtful for people. And, and you have to turn back to that humility and integrity. And as business leaders within the organization, sometimes we have to help them digest, you know, get, get through the comments and actually say, okay, what are they, what are they really trying to say here? You know, and, and, and you'll never make everybody happy. Like, that's just not, that's just not realistic. You will always have the outliers. But the fact that you're trying makes a big difference for people. Just the fact that you listen. And people tangibly see feedback that they have given, and we say, hey, people really hated the aim, uh, the aiming function in Mass Effect 1, so we changed it. We changed the combat for Mass Effect 2 to address that. So, yeah. Go ahead. Is the, uh, is the impetus for, uh, for uh, all these cross-platform tie-in development uh, come from within, or was it, uh, was it driven from without? Like, does, uh, does EA come in and say, like, hey, we really want you guys to engage, uh, engage social, we want you to do doing Facebook, yep. or is that something the team is really passionate about? Is email, like, being, being yeah, I think the answer is yes to both. Like, it's, you know, it, it's obviously been a strategy of EA to build expertise in, in those different areas. Um, but we also really enjoy that idea of, you know, that sustainability, that software as a service. Uh, I think that's really cool to give people that opportunity to live and breathe and play in the universes for an extended period of time. I mean, we've, that's the other, I mean, that's the beautiful part of the worlds that our teams create and the genre that we're in. We've got, you know, we've got great examples of, we, I mean, we, we had a, uh, Neverwinter Nights, um, Hordes of the Underdark. We, we shipped that expansion pack 19 months after the main game sold and at a higher attach rate than the previous one. So it's, just, you know, people want to engage and they want to be part of that. And this is just another way to give them content to consume. So I think a couple more questions. Go ahead. Hey, so you talk about the transition from forums to social. Yeah. Which I find interesting because sometimes people talk about supplementing one another. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask if you, how does that change the feedback that you're acting on? Like, because you're actually engaging with a different kind of person on the social side, maybe, and maybe a, a better picture of your actual overall use. Yep. But how has that affected the choice that you made, you know, to go back and change the game? There, like, we still, we still have our forums, right? So there's, there's still that way for people to engage in our, in our games. Um, again, it's, a. Uh, you know, the, it's part of that push pull. We, I, maybe, maybe I probably didn't say it as accurately as I should have. We still use both. Um, I think we found that there's different feedback that we're getting from the social side than from the forum side. The forum side still tends to be the hardcore of the core. Um, you know, and so it, they're, they're both valid in our worlds and we take feedback from both of them. 
it's a different way to listen to your audience, right? It's a, it's, it's a very powerful way to listen to the audience. So, okay, well, one there and then one there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, when you were showing the slide about all the different, uh, you know, trendy and how right now, still in the middle, there's the sort of IP, but really, you said that it's sort of HD. It's still a bit HD, more HD centric than. Is there a new already of what a buyer would you generally, at the beginning of creating a new game or a new franchise, yeah. to really look at a, a more tightly integrated development of each of those? Stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and I think that, that that might be as short as three or four weeks, and you'll know more. So, but absolutely. Yeah. The teams are absolutely embracing the concept. So, it's a dream come true for a team to be honest, um, to, to have people consume their content that they've created and they have that passion and that love for in different well, ways. That's the idea of, of, from the very beginning of the conversation was about moving forward with IT to instead of saying, oh, how are we going to ask for the path with that, mm -hmm. make a comment or make a movie or make a, if you, if you get it from the beginning, really looking at how each of those things will work together. Yeah, and, and that's, that, that is a, an organic process. Like we're we're still learning how all those different pieces work together. I mean, there's a there's a movie with being developed from Aspect with Legendary. Great partners. They share that same passion with us. Um, but trying to dock in anything that might fit with the movie timelines. I mean, that's that's going to be very challenging. So there's definitely learnings that are still happening on that front. So, go ahead. So you talked about forms being just as valid as the social networks. Yep. Do you guys also take advantage of? Mailing lists, either as purely a push mechanism or actual discussion list for their push handful. Yep. Are you? Have you joined our community? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, yeah, we we uh, we actually do surveys. We do statistical surveys to our community and ask them certain things about our games, either upcoming or or past. Um, we'll do a sample of five thousand, and we sometimes we typically get click-throughs of no less than 50%, but as high as 80%. So they're highly, highly engaged. I mean, your typical click-through on a, on, a, on a survey is in the, 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 high, the high teens at best. Um, very, very engaged. So yeah, we absolutely will. And again, we're, we'll always look for different ways to get feedback. Um, and one of the things that we're you know, still trying to struggle with is the telemetry and the analytics and the customer relationship management stuff. And, and that's where origin comes in and nucleus accounts at, at an EA level is because that's, that's actually a very good way for us to start to learn and understand our, our consumers better so we can actually deliver what they want. I, I mean, ideally, and this, this sounds silly to come from an accountant, but I'd ideally love to be able to put content out and have the customers tell us how much they want to pay for it. Right? Actually just move to a total free model and they say, yeah, this was really great. Here's 20 bucks. Here's 50 bucks. Whatever. You know, it sounds silly, but that's kind of, you know, the direction when you look at it from a, you know, just directionally, that's kind of the way we're going. So we, we already, we already look at our downloadable content model and, you know, our downloadable content modules and, and say, okay, well, what, what do we think this is worth? So. Go ahead. How much of the development team actually enjoys, say, interacting with the, the gaming community? Because on the Bioware forums, uh, with, say, from aspect to the, the Firepower DLC, there was a post by the designer for that pack and saying, here's what I was thinking when I made these weapons. Yeah. And it was nice as a community to read that, but how many people are really willing to write something like that? Um. I'm not, I'm not sure if like everyone is, is willing to do that. It's like anything else. I mean, there's certainly people that are will will engage less with the community. Um, but at Bioware, it's you know everybody has the 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 right and the authority to go online and post. There's certain things that they're you know that obviously you can't announce things that are still unannounced because obviously we want that key marketing beat. And yeah, we've had some mistakes. Some stuff has gone out early, and sometimes people have said things that they regret. But that's that's part of the the trust and the quality in the workplace core value that we have. So, so we, have a we do. We we have a designated community team, and that's one thing that Ray and Greg have been very good at. Is they've they've really worked hard to to build an infrastructure of support around community. As you saw, like they've been firm believers of community since since before Neverwinter Nights launched. Like really, when BG two launched. So, okay. One more. Any more questions? Last one. Do you ever find yourself hearing from the community, like the brand evangelists within your community background to your community team, or do you use 
is that those people in tandem? We've we've hired a lot of people out of the community. Yeah, absolutely. We hired a lot of people from the modding days when you know when people were building the Neverwinter Night modules. I think there was there's like 5,800 of these things roaming around the world out there, and and we had guys that were playing them, and they said, hey, you know, community said you should really check this one out. We've hired quite a few designers that way, quite a few writers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it.